So yes, my name is uh, Andreas uh, Halberg. I come from a Swedish company called uh, Trusec, and I'm going to be talking about secure coding patterns. But not only are they secure, they're also robust and rugged, of course, since this is the uh, rugged track. So robustness is really impo an important word, I think, in security, beca because if it's not robust, it's not likely to be secure. Uh, please remember to rate this session. You all know this, um, so, but I'm repeating it anyway. Uh, so yes, I work at Trusec. Here's us on a company trip in uh, South Africa. Uh, most of my time I spend developing, maybe 95% of my time is spent developing. Uh, used to do a lot of C Sharp, now it's uh, mostly Java these days. Uh, I also do some uh, security code reviews, security penetration testing, security training and stuff like this. Basically anything security related. And if you don't want to know what I look like, uh, that's me right there. And uh, now I've been out talking a little bit in conferences like this. I've noticed I've become uh, somewhat of an internet celebrity. In fact, here's just a sample of the pictures that are out uh, on the internet of me. Yeah, so paparazzi is everywhere. Yeah, not too shabby. Bad hair day, but you know, you can't win them all. So anyway, security, let's talk about it. It's important, or is it? Uh, why, why are we here? Why are, you, why are we discussing this at all? The thing is, when I talk to uh, oh, sorry, too far. Uh, when I talk to developers, I also uh, find a lot of the time that many are disillusioned with security. They say that there's no point in securing my code because if someone wants to get in, you know, they're gonna get in eventually. If the NSA is after me, they're gonna hack me no matter what I do. Well, maybe that's true. If the NSA is after you, but NSA is not after you and your application. Your application is the target of an army of mediocre semi-criminals and kids in basements, okay? That's the, uh, that's the major threat to your, to your uh, application. And the thing is, when we do penetration tests uh, at TrueSec, we don't have to bring out the big guns. We don't use zero days to take over your systems. We just use basic flaws that you could have fixed you know, with a minimal effort. There's a SQL injection, there's a command injection. We can run system commands vi from your website. We can upload a file and, and run it on your website without any problems. These are the trivial mistakes that we find that you can fix. So, just like Josh uh, said this morning, you are the cavalry. The cavalry's not coming, we are the cavalry, okay? And we can fix this. And also, uh, in the uh, rugged manifesto, as Josh was talking about, it said that you should assume that your code is being attacked by a skilled, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but a talented and uh, persistent adversary. I want to say that talented, maybe not so much. You know, don't be afraid, don't be disillusioned. Persistent, yes, these people have a lot of time, but they're not that smart. Don't give them that much credit. They, they're persistent, they use tools, and use the basic flaws. Uh, that you have in your code, and uh, we have in our code. So it's um, here's a picture of a it's not a cavalry man, but an infantry man. This is the Sweden's uh, fictitious national hero Sven Duva, who uh, single-handedly held the bridge against this uh, ragtag army of Russian invaders. Uh, there's no uh, similarity to the internet world, of course. They can be from another country than Russia. But the thing is, armed with a little bit of knowledge and uh, daring, you can ho hold the bridge against uh, this army of mediocre attackers. Okay. It's the 80-20 rule, uh, which we learned is called the Pareto rule, I think. Uh, with 20% effort, you get 80% done. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to be talking about trust, setting the stage for the rest of the talk. I'm going to uh, dive into the, uh, the patterns. Hold on a second. And uh, the first pattern or method I'm going to be talking about is called domain driven security. It's uh, based on domain driven design, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. I'm going to be talking about something called the untrusted pattern. I'm going to be talking about immutability. And finally, the uh, weirdly named the inverse life coach pattern. So let's get started. Trust, the foundation of software security. Ooh, bold words. Yes, it is the foundation of software security. 
many security issues, if not most, boil down to a poor understanding of where we and our code uh, is, are placing the trust. So let us uh, take a look at a typical interaction here. How do we control who we trust? How do we establish trust? This, these are important things. So here's uh, businessman Bob. He's uh, at the bank. They're uh, authenticating uh, themselves to each other. And then uh, Bob wants to transfer X euros from account Y to account Z. And sure, go ahead. So what could go wrong? This is just a, like a typical thing. You have an authentication step, and you have an action that needs to be performed. What could go wrong here? Uh, yeah, so first of all, let's look at the actual authentication. How, does, uh, how can the bank be sure that Bob is indeed Bob? And how can Bob be sure that the bank is the bank? And uh, when he wants to transfer the money, how do we even know that Bob owns account Y? Do we know that account Y holds the amount that he wants to transfer? In fact, uh, yeah. And in fact, do we even know that X is a number? Is it A or minus one or foo or something? So depending on which side you're on, you can really get screwed here. Bob could screw the bank or the bank could screw Bob. So let's visualize trust as a circle of trust. And um, as an application or API, or whatever, we have all this stuff that is outside the circle of trust. You have the user, definitely not trusted. You have the data that's coming. You have the database. You have third-party services, and et cetera, et cetera. And there is a trust boundary here. What that means is that everything outside the trust boundary is untrusted, and everything inside is trusted. And so I'm going to burn your eyes out with this slide here. It's going to be on your retina for the next 30 minutes. So this is really simple, and, and, uh, but an illustrative slide. It has some many important concepts. One is that the trusted area is bounded. It's small. We can enumerate everything inside the trusted area, whereas the untrusted is unbounded. It has no limits. It's so much larger, and meaning that this is why whitelisting versus blacklisting doesn't work. I'll be talking about that a bit later. Whitelisting is where you enumerate everything that is allowed, whereas blacklisting is where you try to enumerate and list everything that's not allowed. And just by looking at this, you can see that blacklisting does not work because everything that's not allowed is practically infinite. So that's why we should do whitelisting over blacklisting. But then, uh, after all, how does something from the untrusted area become trusted? After all, we need to work with all this data, otherwise our application is useless. Uh, well, through every uh, developer's favorite activity, validation, that's the most fun part of your application. That's the first thing you start to do when you write new, th not new features, not, nothing like that. You start with the validation. Maybe not. But the thing is, validation is your tool to make sure that you have trusted data. So two things can happen. Either your data is valid, it, it's in, allowed inside the circle of trust, or it's not valid, it's rejected and bounces out. So validation, uh, there's some different types of validation. Uh, we have the what we would normally think of validation, meaning that is the data valid in the domain? Like we can't transfer A euros or minus one. There's also uh, canonicalization and normalization. I think canonicalization is like C13N or something, if you want to be cool. But uh, this, these are things that must happen before validation. Here you see a potential uh, path traversal attack, as it's called. Maybe you're letting people upload stuff to public file upload. But some uh, attacker sends a file with the file name dot dot slash dot dot slash secrets keys. So your operating system is going to collapse it to see secrets keys. But if you validate this and see that, yeah, it's going to public file upload, you will be the victim of a path traversal attack. So that's normalization. has to happen before validation. Then there's sanitization, uh, where you clean up uh, dangerous or unknown data. And a textbook example is log injection. Uh, you all have logging on your websites. and. Uh, if someone enters a value that you don't recognize, maybe you say, oh, okay, I got this. I expected X euros, but got minus one, and then you log the minus one. How do you know that user doesn't type into a, a new line and a total new row of uh, logging? 
That way, the, the malicious user can actually insert rows into your log. So you have to clean up the data that's coming that you're logging uh, also. So that's sanitization. Now, validation, I mentioned this before. Always prefer white listing over black listing. Remember the image? It's easy to, you, you cannot know everything that's not valid, but you can know what's valid. And another thing with strict validation, uh, besides uh, being a security uh, thing that makes your, uh, that moves stuff from the untrusted to the trusted side, it helps you find bugs early. Instead of you know, getting an exception eight layers down in your code and spending half a day trying to figure out and pouring over stack traces, if you had caught it up here where it entered your application, you would have seen that, oh, this value was minus one or A is not allowed. It could have saved you all that time. So it finds bugs early if you fail fast. So every time you, you validate something, you want it to ask yourself, OK, what is the minimum acceptable range for this parameter? And make your validation not accept any more than that. Because it's always tempting as a developer to say, OK, OK, I have an account number. It, today, it's supposed to be 10 digits. But I know, or I think I know, that you know, in a few months or half a year, management's going to say, you know, now our account numbers are 12 digits or 15. And I don't want to you know, release this code again and have, have them complaining that stuff doesn't work anymore. So I'll just allow 100. Uh, characters for the account number. Don't do that. Be, be safe and say that this is what I know right now and this is what I'm going to validate. So that's uh, briefly about trust and validation. So without further ado, let's get our hands dirty and look at some code. Domain-driven security. How many in here are, f are somewhat familiar with domain-driven design? Uh, hands up. OK, good. That's almost everyone. Yeah, how many know what the domain model is? Just a domain. Yeah. yeah it's, it's not hard. A domain is just like the objects in your solution. If I'm working with a bank, I have an account, I have a user, I have money, and you know those, those types of objects. And domain-driven design talks about how these objects are related to each other, how you create them, how you save them, how you manipulate them, etc. So. Domain-driven security is domain-driven design plus some conventions for validation. It's really simple but profound uh, pattern. And the thing with this is it helps us with the trust boundary, and it gives us validation everywhere in a good way. So domain-driven security was coined by um, uh, two developers at a Swedish company, actually, called Omega Point. So I haven't made this up myself at all. N none of these patterns I've made up myself. I just collected them. Okay. So let's look at our interaction here again. Here's Bob again. So Bob is coming back to the bank. The bank uh, trusts him, and they forget to validate now because, well, Bob was trusted, right? So, but see what uh, he's doing now. He's transferring a minus ten, a minus thousand euros instead from account Y to account Z, and bank says, "Sure, fine. Why not? I've already validated you. I trust you. Everything's fine." And ka-ching, Bob adds, ends up with this note in his pocket. So the thing with, with validation is that you are painfully aware of that it has to be performed over and over, right? And because of this, it's easy to forget to validate somewhere. And it ends up everywhere in the code, but it's still forgotten somewhere. And it's easy to forget to validate something that you think is trusted, like an internal database. Uh, I mean, a database. You think that, oh, this data is coming from the database. You know, we control the database. We should trust it. Well, there's something called cross-site scripting, which you may or may not be familiar with, with people in, where you can inject script tags into uh, HTML pages, essentially running scripts uh, in the context of the logged-in user. So you can store it. If someone inserts a script uh, into your database and you show it on a page, you're the victim of the stored cross-site scripting. That's the... I don't know if you remember the MySpace worm uh, many years ago. That was a cross-site scripting attack. And um, MySpace, uh, funny, uh, just totally off topic here, but I got an email three days ago about a security vulnerability in MySpace. Did anyone of you get this also? Maybe I was, yeah, one guy. <laughs> hey. I didn't even know MySpace existed anymore. I ha apparently, I had a, an account that uh, and they had, an abre had a breach. So they had to email everybody and be publicly shamed. And the developer, maybe even more so. <laughs> uh, so 
let's take a look at the uh, trust boundary again and see how domain-driven security can help with this. So back to the circle of trust. So if you have your reg regular validation of uh, your types, you can still be secure. Right? You validate them, you're inside the circle of trust, everything's green. But this is a picture where it's green. The problem is you can't look at your code and see that this string, which is an account number maybe, or this integer, which is a sum, has been validated. There's no way for you to see that in your code. It doesn't pop out. So domain-driven security, what that does is that primitive types and data structures are untrusted by default. If you see a string, an integer, a byte array, whatever, that's being passed around, you know that it has not been validated. So we always use domain objects. And the special thing, that, which is the security part of domain-driven security, is that all the domain objects, by convention, must have built-in validation. They cannot be created invalid. That is the key convention here. They also a good thing for them to be mutable. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. So uh, with the domain objects, our circle of trust looks like this instead. Uh, we have inside the circle, we have the domain objects. We don't have the primitive types. We don't have strings, integers floating around. So a string containing an account number turns into an account object. An integer, which is an amount, let's see, yeah, it works, it turns out into an amount object. So inside the trust boundary, only the validated domain objects are used. And uh, here's an example of the typical domain object then. You have your account number, which you see, the key part is, is that upon creation, it's validated, right? You cannot create an invalid account number. There can never be an invalid account number being passed around and used somewhere deep in, deep in your code, because you will catch it immediately upon creation. That's it. That's domain-driven security. That's the whole key. Okay? And notice also the final key we're up there. I'm going to discuss that a little bit more later, meaning that it's immutable. So that's it. You have, if you have a domain model, applying domain-driven security is easy. Okay? You just add validation to your domain objects. You have to, of course, remember to do this. It's not going to happen automatically. But after a while, it becomes second nature. And if you see a domain object without validation, you're going to react and say, what's this? This is uh, strange. So if you have a web service, uh, in a circle of trust, you have a SOAP call, integer strings, bytes coming in. You get your user object, you get your account object. But if we get some uh, invalid data, it's just going to bounce off an ex as an exception. So you know, you know that everything inside your circle is going to be fine, and you're going to be happy. We don't have to worry about it. Another thing that domain-driven security uh, does for you is that it, it immediately tells you when you forgot to validate something. So here you have the reticulate function, which reticulates the spline and on some certain angle. But you know what's going on here? In angle, it's integer. What, what is that angle? Can it be negative? Can it be? How large can it be? Is it in radians? Probably not, since it's an integer. But still, there's nothing telling you anything about this angle here. It's just an integer. So this is what it should look like. The angle should have its own domain object. And I think this is a good example because it shows that even such a trivial thing that as, such an, as an angle should have its own domain object. Maybe you're not thinking this way that oh, this is, it's not worthy of an object. It is. It's cheap and easy to create objects. So let's go ahead and do it. So anytime you see something not being a domain object in a, a, a function, a public function in your class, you know that you forgot to validate something. So in the first example, like if you don't have validation in the domain object, now reticulate would have to remember to do the validation. And you, you would, again, get this validation spread out everywhere in your code. Another, another thing is that uh, domain-driven security or domain-driven design actually helps us uh, lean on the type system. So here you have something uh, that heats, heats something up uh, for a certain amount of time to a certain temperature. Maybe it's a reactor, right? So we want it to uh, boil for five minutes, which would probably heat, I don't know, Amsterdam for, or give it electricity for, I have no idea, a minute maybe. But uh, is this really what's going to happen here? You see anything wrong with this? Yeah, yeah. it's not going to boil for five minutes. It's going to be at five uh, cool degrees Celsius for about 100 minutes. So everyone is, everyone is going to start complaining of how nuclear 
energy doesn't work and we should go coal instead because that's much better. So, yeah, of course, this is what you want. Here you have proper domain object. The type system will tell you during compilation if you're calling this function with the object switched. So that's robust and rugged, I think, and it helps you with security. So another thing, when you use domain-driven security for a while, um, seeing validation outside of domain objects almost becomes like a code smell. So here you have something, you pick up an account number for a user from the database. Uh, so we do some validation, throw, a, throw an exception. And, uh, but if it passes the validation, we say, OK, we transfer it. But compare it to this. So what we would do is we would new up an account number, and then we would do the transfer. It's much cleaner, much easier to read. And we know by convention the validation will be done in there. So the code, you know, it's, it's transparent to the, to the successful path use case while, while still protecting you from the, uh, from the, uh, the bad paths. So don't be afraid to create objects. By the way, how many are C Sharp programmers in here? OK, and Java? OK, mostly Java. All right, and anything else? Yeah, a few. Yeah. <laughs> it's still, I think uh, Java is gaining a bit on C Sharp. Uh, I've been asking this question for a, for a while. Cool. Well, I'm in Java myself now after a long time with C Sharp. So. So let's reiterate the essentials of dom domain-driven security. You know by convention that all domain objects are valid because you, that's the convention. You have to validate them. And you know that you forgot to validate something if you see primitive types being passed around, like the angle we had there, or the heat, and the duration, uh, which were integers in the example. That's where the type system comes in and ensures that the correct domain object must be used. And of course, there's still a lot of validation that does not fit inside, uh, inside the uh, domain objects. There's still business rules, like is this user allowed? Does this user have access to this entity or whatever? This stuff, of course, you still have to validate. Maybe there are some more uh, domain objects that can pop out that you can put your validation in, but there's not a place for a domain object everywhere. There's still a bunch of validation that has to be done, but at least you know that the basic building blocks of your application are valid. You will catch these validation bugs early. You will not have them explode down here in the database or close to it. You will catch them up in the, you know, the first service layer you have. And there's one more thing uh, that I want to talk about here, um, which I sort of shoehorn into the domain-driven security design. It's the question about null. What do we do with null? What is null? Null is a construct that some languages have Languages which use a reference type, which is where you need to denote that this is an invalid reference, a reference that has not been instantiated or assigned to an object. So some languages these days do not have null because the dangers of null have been realized. Null is an invalid pointer. It causes exceptions. It's just a bad idea. So never use null in your code. Do not write the word null unless you're doing a null check in your domain object, saying that I'm constructing this from something, and it, the, th the thing that I'm constructing it from should not be null. What are the reasons why you would want to use null? Typical is, oh, this value might not exist. I'm picking something up from the database. It doesn't exist. I'll just return null. Well, <laughs> returning null, uh, and pardon me, is like returning a bag of burning dog crap, okay? And if the person or the code that, that gets this burning bag manages not to get hurt, they're still left with a disgusting, smelly object that they now have to handle. You know, don't be that person that gives someone else a burning bag of dog crap, okay? So make it explicit. Java has this type, the optional of. This is in Java 8, now this is, and this is just a C-sharp example of what it would look like. It's a really simple class. It's a generic that you can uh, wrap your object in, and you can ask it, is it present? If it is present, you can get it. If you try to get it when it's not present, you'll get, then you'll get an exception. But this makes your code really explicit and clear, saying that, yes, when I pick this value up from the database, I don't know if this user or account is going to exist or not, so it's an optional of the user. It's not a user object that could be null, and you have to sprinkle your code with null checks and end up with burning bags of dog crap. Okay. 
Um, just have to C sharp has this construct, this nullable for uh, primitive types, uh, which is used for the, the motivation for this is to use for databases. Basically, the databases work a lot with null. That's fine. And in the fringes of your application, the UI layer, maybe you're de dealing with radio buttons that can use the null also. And down in the database uh, where you're communicating with it, it's convenient to have this. But do not use it in your your domain. Do not use it in your objects. I don't want to see this floating around in your objects. It's just a new way of adding null to your application. It's like null 2.0. Now you have null for primitive types. Yay! So. Don't use that unless you have to, unless it's very convenient at the fringes of your location, uh, your application. The other example, the other typical example where returning null is tempting is when you get into, oh, this, this shouldn't happen, you know? How weird, I'll just return null. No, don't return null. If something is an exceptional circumstance in your application, well, do go ahead and use the aptly name exception and throw that instead. Don't be afraid. It's better. You know, what would you, uh, listening to, uh, to the talk this morning about self-driving cars, would you like the car just to say that, oh, uh, I'll just return null, or would you like it to say, stop, something exceptional has happened, you know, slam the brakes. That's what I would like. So here's uh, an example, and you see the optional pattern at work here also. So you have uh, some kind of repository, you pick uh, up an account for the user, so you get an optional of here. Maybe there is an account for this user, maybe there isn't. And in this case, it is an exceptional circumstance that a user does not have a default account. This is the default account repository. It shouldn't happen. But, you know, don't return null here. Because we don't have an optional. We sh the caller of this code always expects account to be valid or an exception to be thrown. This is the best way to do this. So, when should you uh, return null? When should you use it? Anyone? Anyone? Never. Yes, good. <laughs> okay, so that's trust and domain-driven security. Domain-driven security is great. I've been using it on uh, the project I've been working on for two years now. We've been using domain-driven security, and uh, I can't see myself going back from it. So moving on, the untrusted pattern. This, uh, I learned this from a colleague of mine. I don't know where he got it from, if he made it up himself or if he got it from somewhere, somewhere else. So make trust a first-class concept at trust boundaries. So the un maybe you don't have a domain model, so you can't use domain-driven security. Um, maybe it's a major surgery to introduce a, a domain model into the existing code that you have. So whereas domain-driven security gives us defense like in depth, everywhere. There's validation going on everywhere. The untrusted pattern zooms in on the trust boundary itself. It's like a perimeter uh, defense. So let's take a, look, take a look at this function, foo. It accepts some bar and string, and it validates it, and then it does something with it. So the thing here, there is a trust boundary here, because there's validation going on. We don't trust bar, we validate it, and then we do something with it. But we can't see it, really besides there being a, an exception being thrown. There's nothing telling us how, however, how, uh, whether bar is trusted or untrusted. So a simple thing we can you do, which is really useful, is just renaming it. If we know that something is untrusted, we'll just go ahead and rename it to untrusted of. And I know this violates every naming guideline in C Sharp, but who cares? This is really useful. So uh, first step. Annotate your, uh, your variables with untrusted underscore, and it just becomes a lot clearer what you trust and wh what you do not trust, where you place your trust. So uh, if you look at this function, here's, here you have another function that does something with a bar and a frog, and you have some data coming in. But what's going on here? Do, why do we trust data? Obviously, we don't trust the other ones, so we probably forgot to validate this, or something is not right here. So that's good. It really pops up, help us see what's trusted and not trusted. Um, you can clean this up, you know, have a validate method that returns this um, uh, bar as untrusted or throws if it fails. But uh, we can do better, actually. Uh, there's nothing here that forces us to perform validation. It's just a rename. It's easy to just assign, you know, to call the function do something with, with an untrusted instead, with the untrusted, because it's still a string. 
we can use the type system for this. How about something like this? This looks better, right? We have, we have taken our string and put it into an untrusted box. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we cannot get the string out of the untrusted box without doing validation. So how can we do this? Let's take a look at this untrusted class. So it's just a simple uh, generic uh, wrapper here. It just holds the value. And um, as a getter, you can get the value out of it. Does anyone see anything weird with this object? Does it seem useful to you? No, someone shaking your head. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, there's no getter, really, is there? It's a, there's a private getter. So there's no way of getting the value out. Once you put your value into this untrusted box, it's just going to stay there forever. So uh, how do you use this? Well, C Sharp has this thing, uh, the uh, internals visible to assembly directly. Now, assemblies in C Sharp, it's like, sort of like jar files in Java. It's the packaging unit for, for classes. And you can tell one assembly, or you can say that me, my, me as an assembly, I, I would like to have my internals visible to this other assembly. So if you, in the assembly that contains the untrusted class, have a directive that says that my internals, my private methods, private classes, should be visible to the validation assembly, then we can have, meanwhile, going on in the validation assembly, a validator, which, you can, which has one method called validate, which takes an untrusted value and does a, uses a, a template method here, um, abstract method called inner validate, where it can get the value because the internals of the uh, untrusted class are visible to the validation assembly. So the validation assembly is the only one that can get the value out. And now you can construct your own validators from this base validator. You just have to inherit from this validator and put it in the same assembly, and then you can do stuff like this. So you have an untrusted coming in. It's really clear. You look at the code. Yep, untrusted. It's in the box. We can't access it unless we run it through a validator. So we have to write an account number validator. We have to run, write a validate method. So there's no way you can forget this. Of course, you can just write a do-nothing validator that just returns the, the object. That's, you know, then you're shooting yourself in the, in the foot, aren't you? So quite useful. It prevents you from forgetting to do validation, um, makes the uh, security boundary, the trust boundary, clear, and forces you to do uh, validation. So the thing is, of course, you have to write some glue code to get this going. You have to recognize where your, your trust boundary is and new up these objects. Does anyone want to work with uh, C++ here? Yeah, a few. This pattern is, is really suited for C++. It's better because C++ has uh, friend, friend classes, which make, you can make the visibility thing more granular instead of having the whole assembly open. And it also has uh, implicit constructors, meaning that you don't need the glue code. The compiler will figure out that there is a way for me to con construct an untrusted object uh, and pass it into this function. So the glue code is needed. So if you're doing C++, uh, take a look at this uh, pattern. So that's the untrusted pattern. So we talked about trust, domain-driven security, and the untrusted pattern. I have to drink some water. Next up, immutability. What is immutability means that something can change. Something that is immutable does not change. It's, it's the opposite of mutable, which means something that can change. So stuff passed over a trust boundary, regardless of direction, should not be able to change later. Why? Well, does your application handle concurrency? Maybe you have many threads. How does that affect validation? If the thing you just validated can change, Will it still be valid? Uh, how many have heard of this? Time of check to time of use. One, good. Well, you're all two. You're all about to hear about time of check to time of use. Talk to, if you will. Uh, you've seen this a billion times. It's everywhere, uh, but uh, it's probably you haven't thought about it. Here's a typical talk to case. Here's a time of check. We check if this is a uh, this account contains the amount of money that we want to transfer, and then we use it. Time of check to time of use. Now, you can have problems here. What if amount is, is mutable? It can be changed, and we have a multi-threaded application. Well, something like this could happen. After we've done the check, 
Another, another thread that we're using for some reason that an attacker has figured out that, that he or she can bombard the application with calls, setting the value to a million euros. And if timing is right, this set value, the setter will be call, called just after the check but before the use. So even though we have a check, we're still uh, vulnerable because the amount object is not immutable. It can change and it can be changed by another thread. So even though we think we're good citizens and we've checked this, we're still going to get screwed. So how do you solve this? Well, make internal state immutable. Final. That's the final keyword in uh, Java, uh, read only in C sharp. And get rid of those setters. There's no setter here. And I know that Java and C sharp, they're not immutable languages intrinsically. There are languages nowadays, and um, particularly the functional languages, which where immutability is like a, a, a first-class concept, um, forces you to, to have everything immutable. And if you want to some make something mutable, you have to jump through a lot of hoops. Maybe you can't even do it. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't strive to use immutability in Java or the, the, you know, the normal uh, object-oriented languages. It can be done. It's not like going against the grain. It can be done. It's a little bit more complicated than it should be, but it's definitely worth doing. So because immutability significantly reduces talk to problems, as you see. It plays very well with domain-driven security, readability, parallelization, event sourcing, etc., etc. Immutability is a great thing. It's like a security spray. They can spray over your code, and you have a lot less problems. Uh, who, uh, how many in here knows what a race condition is? Yes, yes, great, everyone. Uh, then you know that a race condition is that if the outcome of some operation depends on the ordering or sequence of events that are outside of your control, they race against each other, then you have a race condition. Let's see a, a typical web example here of this. Uh, imagine a, a wizard base flow, like you have a shopping cart or maybe something on your website, it's like a three-step flow. So in the first one, the customer goes to the, the first page. Yeah, that's a step one. OK, uh, first I just want to mention here, yeah, static, all you concurrency aware people, you think, oh, I should ne would never have a static variable in my web application. That's crazy. But uh, you can imagine that you have some sort of a dependency injection container that, that is a singleton instead, this class, then this would just be a regular member variable. So it wouldn't be that obvious. But you can still end up with these situations where you have, in fact, a static or a singleton. So in the first step, the user comes into the application. Uh, you assign uh, some key, like a uh, GUID or a UID in Java, and you create some wizard data. This holds the stuff that uh, you need to keep track of during the transaction. And then you return the key so that the user can supply the key in the query string, perhaps, in the next call. Second step is that you, uh, you choose a product. So you set the product ID here to some product that the user chooses. And the third step is sort of like the checkout step. If you pick up the, the wizard data, you see that, OK, does the user have access to this product? Can she buy this product? And then you do something with. And here you have the time of check and time of use uh, thing going. So it's easy to see where this is going. Does some, anyone can see what's wrong here? What, can, what could go wrong? How can a, a malicious user that knows that the code looks sort of like this, what could she do? Or he? What, are we, what if? We do this. What if the user bombards our application with calls to, to step two with some other product ID that he knows about that he shouldn't have access to? But right before checking out, he just, just blasts the application with calls to step two. And maybe if the timing is just exactly right, it will end up after the check but before the use. So the, uh, this user will get access to this uh, secret product that he wouldn't have access to. So how do we fix this? Immutability, of course. Let's look at it again. It looks pretty much the same, only now we have something called immutable data up here. Step one, everything is the same, just immutable data. Step two, here's the difference. If something is immutable, we can't change it. There's no setter for this, this uh, product. So we have to create a new object. So we have written a convenience method called clone with product ID, meaning that it takes all the properties that this object has, clones them, and then with a new product ID. You can imagine that there's other 
properties on this object except the, the product ID. Step three looks exactly the same. There's nothing, nothing changed here. And there we still have a time of check to time of use. We always, we always have that. But now we have no problem because the data is immutable. It doesn't matter how many threads that try to change or uh, uh, call step two in between here. They'll just create a new uh, data object that is not being used right now in step three. So we're safe. Nothing will change between time of check to time of use. So immutability, like I said, a security spray. It's a great thing. It helps you with security and bugs and concurrency in general. Go for it. Use immutability as much as you can. It should be the norm. When you see an object that is mutable, you should, oh, you should cringe and feel bad because you know this is dangerous. What you can do is, of course, something has to be immutable. Sometime, somewhere, probably something needs to change. But try to, try to contain it. Try to minimize it. Maybe you have a large object where if you have 20 properties, maybe only three of them are mutable. Well, factor out the mutable object and, and keep it isolated. So you can have it, you know where it is, you know where the mutable state is, and maybe it can be refactored later, or at least you have better control of where the mutable state is. It will help you a lot. So that was uh, immutability. Now uh, let's talk about the uh, final uh, pattern which uh, we're going to talk about today. It's called the inverse life coach pattern. Be a pessimist. Okay, so what's the inverse life, life coach pattern? Before we uh, look at that, we have to look at the anti-pattern, which is called the life coach pattern. It looks uh, something like this. You've all seen and uh, maybe written a function that starts uh, like this. And you can just hear the, the life coach here. You, my friend, you have done nothing, but you are a success. Your life is going to be great. No matter what happens in a bunch of code here, we're still going to return and you're going to be successful. And even if you do, I'm still going to charge you. That's what's so great about being a life coach. It's awesome. So what happens here, what can happen here, of course, is that something goes wrong in here and you return prematurely and success is still true. The client of your code will think that everything went well when it didn't. And this is sort of what happened in the, uh, uh, what's it called, go to fail, if you remember that a few years ago. It was on uh, OS X, go to fail bug that bypassed the uh, certificate validation was uh, a, a case of the life coach pattern. So this is what it should look like. You should be a pessimist. You, you have not done anything. You are not a success yet. You have to prove yourself in a bunch of code. You have to go through it. And maybe if you're good, you get out on the other side as a success. Of course, we use, this is uh, not a very domain, uh, sorry, object-oriented example. Uh, we use uh, objects instead. Fail fast and force a narrow path of success. Fail fast, meaning that if you tr try to um, do the validation first, and if something's not valid, you throw an exception. There's a bunch of code happening, and then you return the data. And the only way of getting out of this function is returning a valid domain object. There's no success, true, or false parameter here. Either you throw an exception, or you return a valid domain object. There's no other way to do this. So when you apply this, this pattern to your code, um, your code is going to start to look a lot like this. You have the, uh, some validation. If d da 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 yada yada, throw. If not this, then throw. If not this, then throw. Code happening and return. I'm not saying that you should always use a single return statement. That's not what I'm saying. Multiple re return statements are fine in the languages that we're using. But I'm just saying that if your code looks like this, it's probably good. If your code looks like this, it's maybe it's not as good. I'm not saying it's definitely wrong. I have functions that look like this and that are perfectly fine. But still, you know, if you use this pattern, you're going to expect your functions to look a lot more like the previous example, where you have these sections of validation, then you have the code, and then you return something. So give yourself, you give your code a narrow, challenging, path of success, where you either throw an exception or you return a valid domain object. That's the inverse life coach pattern. Yeah. So uh, we have about 10 minutes. That's good. I'm going to wrap things up. I have, uh, there are five things to take home with you from this uh, session. Consider your trust boundaries. 
That's the important part. So many security issues boil down to a poor understanding of where you're placing your trust. You want to minimize where you place your trust. You want to trust as little as possible. You're in, inside the circle of trust, everything's trusted. Outside, it's untrusted. The untrusted area is practically infinite, where the trusted is bounded and you can control it with whitelisting. Domain-driven security, a great pattern. If you have domain-driven design already in your application, go ahead and look into domain-driven security. Uh, you're not going to regret it. Only validated domain objects, no primitive types. They're untrusted. It's very easy, very simple, uh, but it has a profound impact, impact on your application. It will give you defense in depth. Immutability should be the norm. Try to make all your objects immutable. If you see something mutable, you know, think deeply. Does this have to be mutable? Is there really a reason? Or is there, is there an immutable object that wants to get out of this? I mean, try to use it everywhere in your application. Use the builder pattern for instead of setting properties in your constructors. Instead of newing up an object and then setting 10 properties. Use a builder pattern that lets you build it in a nice way and then creates an immutable object. Yeah. Null is a burning bag of dog poop. Don't use null. Use optional. Uh, throw an exception if something is an exceptional circumstance. Don't pass around null. Okay. Null is a, it's a construct that some languages need to have. doesn't mean you need to use it. Okay. And uh, last but not least, fire a life coach. You don't need them. Okay. It's better to be a pessimist and assume failure and force a uh, narrow path of success. And I'd like to conclude uh, here with the words of... Uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who I think said it best when he said, For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, but the gate is small and the road is narrow that leads to your code returning a valid domain object. That's what he said. It's true. 2,000 years ago. And few are the code paths that find this gate. So I want to thank you very much for listening, and I hope you learned something that you can uh, take home with you and apply to your code. Uh, immediately and gives you uh, robust, rugged, and secure code. And uh, please remember, rate this session. And if you want to contact me, uh, you can tweet me. And uh, there's, uh, we have a blog, TrueSec, which uh, where we write uh, uh, interesting stuff. I think I'm not biased at all. So yeah, go ahead <laughs> and, and visit it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Okay. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, too many questions uh, via the app. Uh, actually, fortunately, but we, we cannot ask them all, so please uh, ask uh, Andreas afterwards. Um, I just picked three. Um, uh, the idea of domain model for passing parameters is good, but it, is al it also produces a lot of memory overhead. How can we balance that? Well, I think you uh, need to ask yourself, is memory overhead a problem for your application? These, these are typically short-lived objects, easily uh, collected by your garbage collector. Not, a, not usually a problem. If you're working with maybe trading or games, uh, where also exceptions is a problem performance-wise, as well as objects, yes, maybe you have an issue. But then you're probably programming in C++ anyway. I, I think that you, you uh, the, the question of performance always comes up, right? But it's always easier to do. We're so keen on doing premature optimization. So that's why I say don't be afraid. Create a lot of objects. I don't think it's going to be a problem. If you have a typical, if you have a special domain where this is a problem, fine. You know, you need to deal with it. But most, maybe you think you do, but I think it's more likely that you don't. That's my answer. Okay. Um, have you used immutables.org uh, while implementing domain-driven security patterns? Have you heard of it? No. Nope. No. Nope. Okay. Look it up. Um, what if a domain object can't validate itself because it has dependencies? What if a domain object can't validate itself because it has dependencies? Well, I don't know what dependencies that might be. Um, you, you're not calling a service from a domain object. That's all you can pass in a service. Uh, well, the domain objects I do usually can validate themselves. Is there a concrete, the uh, person asked the question, maybe have a, a concrete example? 
Yeah, we can talk about this uh, afterward, who, who wrote the question, but uh, uh, the dependencies that your domain objects have should themselves be validated already if they are domain objects. So usually it works out. Okay, and the last one, um, the domain objects you showed, they are actually value types. <laughs> okay, yeah, Angle is more of a value type. Okay, yeah. Good. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.